Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, please. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. We're going to begin reading at verse 39. Uh, but before we do, a brief uh, prayer. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves to your word and live this day in obedience to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Luke 22 and verse 39, we continue in our series not only through the gospel of Luke, but as we're coming to an end, we're focusing on specifically the killing of Jesus. And we direct our attention to another scene in this real life true crime drama. Luke 22 and verse 39, he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation." And while he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour. And the power of darkness. Then they seized him, led him away, bringing him into the high priest house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. A servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man also was with him. He too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked. Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody, they were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him blaspheming him. I want you this morning to think of the darkest place you've ever been. A dark place of anguish and despair. A place 
where you felt all alone and the burdens of your worst fears were overwhelming you. The place where the one thing you wanted from God was the one thing he determined you could not have. The place where you wish that you could be anywhere else in the world except in the place where you were. A place so bad that you thought you were about to die and maybe you almost did. Whatever that place is in your mind, in your past, or perhaps even right now in your present circumstance, I want you to know this morning that Jesus went to a place much darker than even that. And he went to that place as he left the upper room of the Last Supper and journeyed up the hillside to a garden called Gethsemane. Today we want to consider Jesus' hour of darkness, as we call it, in this sequence of events. Several things I'd like for you to note from our text. First of all, I want you to see the agony of Jesus. The agony of Jesus. Gethsemane was a favorite place of the Lord that he frequented often. It's a garden actually still in existence today, filled with olive trees, which would make sense that Gethsemane is located on the Mount of Olives. It provides a setting of quiet solitude just outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. Now, for Jesus and his disciples, Gethsemane was a place that they loved. They enjoyed fellowship together. They would go there to rest from long days of ministry, and it was a place they would go to pray together and discuss spiritual things. We can only imagine the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. But on this night, it became a place of excruciating sorrow. It became a place of deep darkness, the anguish of Christ that evening is really so much greater than I could ever articulate or that we could ever really understand. Uh, One commentator said, no man will ever be capable of sounding the depths of what the Savior experienced in Gethsemane when the full reality of his suffering, both in soul and body, penetrated into his immaculate spirit. Jesus began his hour of darkness by going into a season of mental sorrow, mental anguish. And he addresses that mental anguish with a desire to pray, more specifically to have his disciples pray with him. It really is a great example to all of us as one of the things that we ought to do in the seasons of our darkness and the agonies of our suffering. Verse 41 says, he knelt down and prayed. When it seems like we cannot see any light in front of us, even if we don't know what to pray, the best example that we have is to pray. The content of Jesus' praying shows us the backdrop of this excruciating agony and sorrow that he's experiencing. Because in verse 42, as he's praying there, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. The cup. He's talking about the, the cup that he is drinking and will drink dry. When he breathes his last breath on the cross. Father, if you're willing, if you're you're willing, let this cup pass from me. It's the cup of human suffering. It's the cup of sin's imputation upon his body and his soul. 
It's the cup of divine separation from God the Father, something he has never experienced ever before in his whole existence. And when Jesus humanly speaking, begins to face the agony of what's ahead of him. He cries out, Father, is there any other way to save our people than for their sin and curse to be put on me for us to have to go through this separation? And when you think about the prayer, how how could this even be? I mean, Jesus is the God-man. Can God be divided against himself? Well, no, he cannot. Here's how we have to understand the agony of this prayer from the God-man, Jesus. With respect to his divine nature, Jesus had no other will than the Father's will because the Father and the Son are one. But with respect to his human nature, Jesus had to choose to be obedient to the Father. For though he is God, he was also robed in flesh, a flesh that is weak, a flesh that goes through suffering. You see, in the incarnation, the incarnation, Jesus did face suffering. He did face emotional trauma. He did face agony all without sin. And that's the sorrow of this moment Jesus is facing. In humanity, he had to choose to be obedient to the Father's will. And this is the choice that Jesus made, verse 42. Not my will, but yours be done. Not the will of my humanity, but the will of my divinity. J.C. Ryle said, at no time is such submission of will so needful as in the day of sorrow. And in nothing does it shine so brightly as in the believer's prayer. He who can say from his heart when a bitter cup is before him, not my will but thine be done, that person has reached a high position in the school of faith. Now this agony that Jesus is experiencing, I need you to understand, church family, this is an agony of the deepest and darkest degree. Remember who Luke is. Luke is a medical doctor. And medical doctor, Dr. Luke, takes time to show us the clinical nature of what Jesus' body is going through under the intensity of his emotional and mental anguish. His struggle, according to verse 44, Dr. Luke says, is so intense that his sweat, His sweat became like great drops of blood which would fall to the ground as he agonized in prayer. You have to consider it like this. Physically and emotionally speaking, Jesus had nearly reached his limit. In fact, Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel record for us that his sorrow was unto death. Death, that that is in the garden, not even to Gethsemane yet or, or, or to Calvary yet, but in the garden, Jesus felt as if he would nearly die. That's how much anguish his humanity was facing. One little book that has become so helpful to me in my studies on mental psychology and understanding all the dynamics of what we go through in our brains is a book written by B.B. Warfield called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. Small little book that I think many of you would be interested in reading one weekend. B.B. Warfield said, In these supreme moments, our Lord sounded the ultimate depths of human anxiety. The scope of these sufferings were very broad, embracing 
that whole series of painful emotions which runs from a consternation that is appalled to a despondency which is nearly despair to a sense of well nigh complete desolation. In the presence of this mental anguish, the physical tortures of the crucifixion retire into the background. And we may well believe that our Lord, though he died on the cross, yet died not of the cross, but of a broken heart. That is to say, of the strain of his mental suffering. Charles Spurgeon commenting said, since it would not be possible for any believer, however experienced, to know for himself all that our Lord endured in mental suffering. It is clearly far beyond my capacity, Spurgeon says, to set it forth to you. Jesus himself must give you access to the wonders of Gethsemane. As for me, I can only invite you to come into the garden. And that's what we're doing here. This is what Dr. Luke is leading us to do. He wants us to come into the garden and see the suffering and agony and anguish and the emotional despondency of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also see that there is no greater way to face our hour of darkness than to face it on our knees in prayer. More specifically, to face it on our knees in prayer, expressing full submission to the will of God, our Father. We may not be able to understand it. We may not can make sense of it. We may not know how longer we will tread this darkness, but we must pray as hard as we can. Not my will, but your will be done. I mentioned earlier that was one of the one of the things that moved me last night when I was with Joyce, she kept saying over and over again, Pastor, this is the will of the Lord, and I'm fine with that. This is the will of the Lord, and I'm fine with that. I mean, three or four times, this is the will of the Lord. I'm fine with that. Here in a moment of darkness, we have a precious saint of the Lord understanding agony and suffering, and sorrow, but yet saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. We're okay with that. This hour of darkness, we see the agony of Jesus. Secondly, we see the sovereignty of Jesus. While in the garden undergoing the darkness of emotional sorrow and agony, we find that Judas shows up with his group of soldiers all of this is under the direction of the chief religious leaders in Israel who are out to kill Jesus. And so immediately Jesus comes into the garden where Jesus is. He finds Jesus and he kisses him. Now this kiss was a common greeting in that culture. It's a common greeting in some cultures today. It is not a common greeting in my culture. <laughs> Just want you to know that. I've had a few of you try from time to time, and I just need you to know I have a buffer zone, all right? I have a buffer zone. But in this culture, it was a common greeting. It expressed love and friendship. Think about that for a moment. The greeting of a kiss on the cheek, it expressed love and friendship. But on that night, Judas was simply doing it as a prearranged agreement to identify who Jesus was so the soldiers could take him into custody. Judas betrays Jesus with an expression of love and respect. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. Friends, to betray Christ in any circumstance is a sin above all sins. But to betray him with a symbol of love and affection is the worst of all sinful actions. Disciples are watching what's happening. They're, they're ready to fight as we knew they would be. After all, they just told the Lord, we got two swords. So Peter takes out his sword and I believe he goes for the head of one of those soldiers but misses. Kind of like Aaron Judge in the World Series right now. He goes for the head of one of those soldiers. He misses. He cuts off his right ear. 
Now look, there is zealousness here, no doubt about it. And it's a zealousness that we might admire on the surface. But physically fighting against the Lord's enemy, that was never a part of the discipleship curriculum Jesus took them through. It further shows us just how far off the disciples' understanding of Christ's mission still is. Because in that moment, listen to me, they find it easier to fight a physical war for Jesus than to endure suffering with Jesus. How often is that true in our own lives? We find it easier to get into a verbal altercation. We find it easier to fight physical battles. We we find it easy to go to war with one another than we are to remain silent and endure the suffering that Jesus has willed for our lives. So with the man's ear lying on the ground, Jesus says in verse 51, no more of this. Stop it. Every parent in this room understands the language. No more. Stop Miraculously, he picks up the ear, puts it back into place, perfectedly healing it. I think Peter meant well. I know we aim to give him a hard time. In fact, I think we would say we know he meant well. But his actions were working against the very will of the Father. Jesus wasn't interested in his disciples physically defending him. He just wanted them to pray and endure the agony of suffering with him. But this is what I want you to focus your attention on for just a moment before we move further. Because right here as this is all unfolding, Jesus criticizes the way they've come out to arrest him as if he's some sort of untamed terrorist. Jesus is actually willingly giving himself up to him, up up to them. And that's why it says in verse 53, this is your hour, the power of darkness. I want you to think about that statement for a moment. You've come out with all these soldiers and clubs and swords ready to fight, but I want you to know that this, this is your hour. He's declaring his sovereign control over the whole situation. Even the darkness. He could have stopped it. But the will of God was for Jesus to be betrayed. The will of God was for Jesus to be arrested. The will of God was for Jesus to be crucified. And it was without question a dark moment in Jesus' suffering. But it was a dark moment of suffering that God had ordained and was sovereignly in control of. Don't miss this. When he looks at them and says, this is your hour, what he's actually saying is, I'm letting you do this. (laughs) Look at how you've come out to fight me. Do you not understand? I'm letting you do this. I could stop the whole thing if I wanted to, but that's not the Father's will. The Father's will is for you to take me, go ahead, enjoy it. This is your hour. I've given you this hour. By the way, this hour wasn't 60 minutes on a clock. It's a distinct period of time when darkness dominates. It's a period of time when evil appears to be winning. The sovereignty of God is permitting this to happen and he's permitting it to happen for the purpose of Jesus becoming the once and for all sacrifice for sin. But another way to look at that 60 minutes is that Jesus is permitting it to happen for a distinct period of time. In other words, the darkness will not be on top forever. He said, this is your hour of darkness, the proverbial hour. It may not mean 60 literal minutes, but it does have an ending. The darkness does have an ending. And my point to this is to say to you this morning that whatever our present darkness is, it is under the sovereign control of God. God. 
God is at work at all times. He's in the work when you're in the light, and he's at work when you're in the darkness. He's at work when we're suffering. He's at work when we've been betrayed. He's at work when it seems all is lost and falling apart. He's in control of the circumstances. He's in control of the intensity of the circumstances. And he's in control of the time frame of those circumstances. Jesus is sovereign over everything, everything. And in the hour of darkness, I beg you to trust the sovereign control of God. For every hour is God's hour. And by grace and power, he will use every hour, even the hour of darkness, for his glory and our good. Follow me. In this hour of darkness, we have the agony of Jesus. We have the sovereignty of Jesus. Right down number three, we have the mercy of Jesus. The darkness of that night continued, didn't it? They arrest Jesus. They take him away. All of his disciples seem to scatter except for Peter. Peter chooses to follow Jesus at a distance where he eventually finds himself in a courtyard outside of the very place where Jesus is being held in custody. Now, the Lord had just told Peter a few hours ago as we studied last Lord's Day that before the rooster crows that morning, he was going to deny that he even knew Jesus three distinct times. And now those very words are unfolding in the courtyard where Peter is. And initially, he's completely oblivious to the whole situation. The first person comes and says, this man was with him. Peter says, woman, I don't know him. The second person says, you're also one of them. And Peter again says, no, no, I'm not. The third one emphasizes rather firmly, yes, certainly, certainly you're with him. You're a Galilean. I recognize you. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Three distinct times. And in verse 60, it says immediately why he was still denying him. While he was still ignoring that he knew him, the the, the rooster crowed. But notice what happened next. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Immediately. Now, I'm not here this morning to park on Peter's great failure, but to rather point out Jesus' great mercy. We don't know the specifics of how Jesus' cell that he was being held in provided a viewpoint to Peter in the courtyard and vice versa. I've been there, but with the remains, it's not really easy to understand how that would have happened. All, All we know is that Jesus looked at Peter in that moment of his biggest failure. Now follow me. Darkness had come upon the day. Darkness had come upon Jesus. And now darkness has come upon Peter. But this is what I want you to notice about the look that Jesus is giving him. Because I do not believe this was a look of reproach or or judgment. We might all have a sense of understanding what the look means, however you want to interpret that. Maybe it's a teenager in the room that gets the look from his parents. Maybe it's more like a husband who gets the look from his wife. And typically when you get the look, it's not a good look. I don't think that was the case at all. I believe this was a look of loving compassion. I think it was a look of tender mercy. It was an expression of the gentle and lowly Savior. You see, when Peter made eye contact with Jesus, he was immediately reminded of the error of his pride, the reality of his weaknesses, and the shame of his failure. But what he saw on Jesus' face early that morning was something he had seen before. And in that moment, he was also reminded of the merciful love of his Lord. Think about this, even on Jesus' perspective, of all that he was going through, of all the darkness that Jesus was facing, Peter saw his Lord taking the time to look at him. 
to show by the look in his eyes that he loved him and to remind them by the look in his eyes that he promised Peter would come through this. The eyes of Jesus preached a sermon that I believe Peter would never forget. That in the darkness of personal failure, there is the light of mercy in the face of Jesus. J.C. Ryle said, the love of Christ toward his people is a deep well which has no bottom. Sometimes we feel like when we mess up that Jesus is there with his rod iron ready to whack us over the side of the head. But more often than not, it's Jesus sitting there gentle and lowly, merciful, compassionate, and loving, ready to draw us to himself, to grasp us with his care and compassion, and to love on us in the dark. Because that look that Jesus gave Peter, it caused him to weep bitterly. That's more than tears of regret. Those are tears of repentance. Hey, look right here. Jesus not only knew Peter's weaknesses, he knows your weaknesses too. Has it ever registered with you that Jesus knew the failures you would have before he even called you to follow him and he still called you to follow him? Now, friends, that's no excuse to sin. But it is a reminder that Christ looks at the failures of his people with eyes of mercy. Jesus wasn't looking at Peter and saying, look at this mess you made. I I told you this was going to happen as if he was rubbing it in his face. No, this look was more like, now Peter, I still love you. And I'm going to help you come through this. That's how Jesus is looking at you who are in the dark, those of you who messed up again this week. He's wanting you to look into his eyes this morning, not so that he can rub it in your face that you're a failure and weak and this is going to be the story of your life. No, he wants you to look into his eyes and to see that he still loves you and he's going to help you get through this as he has done before. He is going to do again. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes is this. Christ's love for us is not wearied by our sins. Let me give you this last one and we're done. In fact, I'm just going to mention it. You can write it down and read it later. It's the blaspheming of Jesus. The blaspheming of Jesus. We see that in verses 63 through 65. As Jesus is being held in custody, they begin mocking him and blaspheming him. It's another difficult scene from the hour of darkness that Jesus is facing. I mean, think about this. This was a long night. Darkness in the garden as he prayed through his mental anguish and arrest. Darkness in the courtyard as Peter denied even knowing him. And now darkness in the cell where he's being held in custody as Jesus was unjustly subjected to physical abuse and spiritual blasphemy. This is without question an hour of darkness. But here's how I want to break the sermon to a close, especially on Reformation Sunday. I love how the Lord works this out. Brings us to a text in which he reminds us of the significance of what he has done in the world throughout history. Have you ever heard the Latin phrase post tenebras lux? Post tenebras lux. It's Latin. It became the motto unofficially of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. In English, it's interpreted this after darkness, light. After darkness, light. Post tenebras. Luke's. Now, that's not a Harry Potter formula. That is actually a Latin phrase. After darkness, light. 
That motto of the Protestant Reformation illustrated God's gracious recovery of the gospel light during a very dark hour in church history. It was an hour when the authority of Scripture and the doctrine of justification by faith alone was hidden by corrupt darkness in the church. But through the influence of men like Martin Luther, who stood up against the corrupt teachings of the church, namely that good works and money would forgive sin and bring salvation, the light of the gospel through their efforts broke through that darkness. Luther nailed his 95 theses against the Catholic Church on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and that act sparked a flame that would burn like fire across the whole continent of Europe. And to our hearts today, people began to see that God would save them by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, and for the glory of God alone. Yes, there was darkness in those medieval days for an hour, but then came light. Post Tenebras Luke's after darkness, light. It is the story of our walk with Jesus, isn't it? Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walked in darkness have now seen a great light. Those who once dwelt in a land of deep darkness, the light has now shone upon them. And of course, in that great Old Testament description of the coming Messiah, Isaiah 53, 11, it says of Jesus, out of the anguish, out of the darkness of his soul, he shall see light. After darkness, light. It's only for an hour. It's only for a time. But in three days, he will rise again from the dead. And the darkness will be no more. The light will shine. Redemption is sealed. Salvation is available to all who come to him. Your life may be in darkness today, but it won't be there forever. Run to Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's a light that shines in the dark. He's a light that expels the dark. On this Reformation Lord's Day, may we remind ourselves of post Tenebras Luke's after darkness light. Run to the light. See the light. Rest in the light. It is Jesus who has come to remove the darkness in your life. Let's stand together for prayer this morning.